Okay guys, so in this video we are going to have a look at SOA, microservices and monoliths. So let's get into it. So what we're going to cover is what is SOA, what is a microservice and what is a monolith. And then we're going to talk a little bit about when one makes sense over the other. So the thing that needs to be said now is that for most of the industry, in most companies out there in IT, the reason why we talk about SOA microservices and monoliths mostly is because it is pretty much what everybody is using. And the thing that I think is extremely important to understand is the differences between these three paradigms of working and why these different paradigms have evolved into what they are today. Because if you think that there is one here that is superior over the others, you are wrong. It's very simple. The the differences are there for different use cases. Most of you may believe that just because the internet is telling you that, oh, microservices, hottest thing around, right? It's the only thing that matters. Wrong. It is absolutely wrong. In fact, most companies don't actually use microservices. Most companies are either on a SOA solution or a monolithic application solution. And the reason why you keep hearing about microservices is because it's the new hot sexy thing around. And if you didn't know that, most people don't make tech talks about things that everybody's using that's ordinary and boring. They do tech talks on the things that are hyped, the things that are trendy. But I believe that you should understand the different considerations when we pick one of these paradigms. So I've created a little small project here that should hopefully showcase exactly what I mean. So there's this server here and I'm just running it. I'm running a few versions here. So I have some mono app here and some SOA stuff here and some microservices stuff here. And we're just gonna walk through each of these in turn. So we're, we're going to start with a monolithic application. So let's have a look at my API here. So my monolithic application is running on port 3006 and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to place an order. So I'm going to post, I'm going to say book ID 1 and user ID 1 and then I'm going to place an order. Ta-da! So we got a JSON response back stating that okay here's your order, it's been placed, it's all good, right? This is our entire application, the, there's nothing more to it. So if we start looking at the monolithic application, there's one file here called app. It's just an express server. I have some hard-coded data here, and then I parse some JSON. I have a users endpoint where I can grab a user. I have a books endpoint where I can list some books, and then I can select a book, and then I can place an order. It's all stub data here, but hopefully you can see the illustration. Like This could be a very sophisticated large system. It's a very standard thing. It's basically a web shop API. So the thing that makes this a monolithic application is that it is one single system. There is no external dependencies for this system to actually do what it's supposed to be doing, which is what we call a distributed system. A distributed system, which is the thing that you that SOA uses, and SOA stands for Service Oriented Architecture, is the way that you think should think about that is that you may have multiple sections of code here, different modules or different parts of your system that are in a separate product that are running on a separate server somewhere else. And in order for you to deliver your user experience, you need to use both of those servers together in order to deliver that value. But a monolithic application is simply all found in the same server. So it's all, it doesn't have this case, I mean, this is a very small server, of course, it doesn't have to be in the same file, it just has to be the same server. And in a large system, this is usually the case, like you have a, a massive amount of files and a lot of endpoints and a lot of different code that goes into one single repository and then everybody just uses that one single code base. Now, this thing here is by far and wide the simplest thing there is. In, in application development. There is there's nothing simpler than a monolithic application. Uh, let me state that again. There is nothing simpler. Every single company under the sun wishes they could stick with a, a, a monolithic application. The problem is that at large scale, is it, this is almost impossible. There will come a point where a monolithic application, if it grows big enough, becomes a problem, not just, it can become a problem from a performance perspective that 
there are simply too many requests or that there is too much cost or so forth to just run one single super system like that. There can also be a scaling problem from just development when you work on a big application, like if you have a lot of code and everybody's contributing to the same code base, you're going to get in each other's way very often. It's going to be a lot of conflicts in the code and you're going to have a lot of people who try to schedule work and so forth. That might be a problem. But when you're working at small scale, this is the best thing ever. It is the thing that I would say most of you should start this way and most companies actually do start this way. Most startups do not start with microservices. Most startups use a monolithic applications. The same thing goes for larger companies. Quite a lot of them have a monolithic application or at least a SOA application where they might have some monolithic application and some smaller services that do some sort of work right. The thing that you should commit, kind of commit to memory here, if you take just one way, one thing away from this video of mine, is that these architectures are really only about where does the code go. Does it live in one single repository? Does most of the code live in one repository and then some small, small part of the code lives in another repository? Or is it fairly equally distributed? These are some of the main differences between monoliths. SOA and microservices. So this is a monolithic application and as I said it's the simplest thing. You should almost always start with a monolithic, app monolithic application. Let's talk about SOA. So SOA stands as I said for service oriented architecture and if we have a look at me con like connecting to a SOA application. So this is a SOA application if I hit that endpoint boom back I get the exact same thing as I did in a monolithic application and that's the, the reason why I make this little dumb call is because I want to highlight to you that from the perspective of the user there is no difference at all. It's just a magical interface that does something. It doesn't matter if you have a monolithic application, if it works for you. It doesn't matter if you have a, you're running microservices or so on, whatever you're using. It doesn't, to the user, it does not matter. They don't care at all. Their experiences will be equal regardless of which one you use. That is sort of true, but there are it's not a hundred percent true, but for most cases it's going to be an equal experience. So in the SOA architecture it's very similar. So we have an application here. So we can see here that these are the same endpoints pretty much, except for one thing. The orders. So this is the orders service, and this is our monolithic application. Now, why do I call this a monolithic application? Well, because of the same thing I was saying earlier. This monolithic application is, and this is may not, it may not always be semantically correct, but quite a lot of developers, they just call a, a monolithic application is just a big pile of code. It's just a really big system, and some people use monolithic application as a curse word. It's just a way for saying, oh, this is a legacy shit system that we have to maintain, or it's really ugly or something like that, because, hey, microservices is all this rage, right? Which is, as I said, not true. But for a large system like this, what usually happens is for most companies is that they start on a monolithic application. They start working. The company meets some type of success and all of a sudden they find that, oh shit, we have too many people working on the same code base. Uh, or some part of the system is very un unperformant or something like that. Usually it is um, just a problem with developers getting in each other's way. It's usually a logistics problem that causes people go to go to a SOAR architecture. So they start with the monolithic application, usually, and then they realize that, that, you know what, we need a team that commits fully to just dealing with orders in our system. And then what do you do? Do you split everything out into microservices? Well, you could, but most people don't do that because it's a big big, big hassle to move a monolithic application to microservices. It takes a lot of time. So what you usually do is that you say, okay, we're just going to do a migration, like a partial thing. We're going to move the orders logic over to its own service so that we can dedicate a few teams or some like a group of people that just take care of that one part, right, to that part of the system. So what you do is you click take this code here and you move it to its own thing. And here it is. And now you have a dependency. So the orders module here is now dependent on the monolithic application where most of the code lives. So here you see now that it's the same thing. 
in the first case we just could keep everything internal because we were all in one big system so I have this the the we have the same database and like all of the same services and logic and so forth but now we need to make our own API call so when I called this endpoint earlier what's happened was that I first went to the to my monolithic application I got the book and then I got the user and then I created the order. That's the only difference. So there's now two systems, one small system or one service called an order service and the monolithic application. And this is now per definition a distributed system because there's two servers interacting in order to create that bigger value or to create that API experience that we just had earlier. Now, this is, you should, I will tell you right now, if you haven't worked at a larger company or like in a professional capacity and you don't know about this, you will see this very quickly. This is, it's either a monolithic application or a SOA architecture of some sort that most of you are going to deal with. It's only a very small percentage of companies who use microservices. Let me explain why. So, if we have a look at microservices, let's have a look at that. So let's close down this. Here we have our microservices. And if I go and I look at the orders here, let's see if I remember. So the orders are on 3003. So let's go all the way over here and let's hit that endpoint. And it's the exact same thing as the other, other two. So what's the difference here? Well, in a microservice or an oriented way of working. Now, the problem with microservices is that nobody actually knows what the microservice is. No one. There's no definition for what a microservice is. Some people will claim that a microservice is like a single function running in a server. Some people will claim that it is a domain entity, like we have one service that is responsible for the books and one for the orders and one for the users and so forth. And some people claim that there's a different type of thing, right? But at its core, the only difference if we go with the normal definition of a microservice between a microservice and a SOA architecture is that there is a size limit or like a responsibility distribution that is different. So in a SOA architecture, there is not really a guideline for where which logic is going to go. But in a microservice or microservices architecture, you usually create much smaller services that are responsible for one part of the whole. So here you see that I have the books API. This entity or this microservice is just responsible for books. And then I have the users and this service is just responsible for the users. That's it. And then we have the orders. And from the perspective of the orders, it's a very similar thing. It's just that we're, co we're, not, content we're not just communicating with one single monolithic application. We're talking to multiple services. That's it. And th this is the fundamental difference. In a simple case like this, it almost feels, as hopefully I can relay here, it feels kind of silly. As, as With this, this, this small amount of code, it's such a silly thing. It, there is no ban benefit to having microservices at a scale of this size. Unless for some reason there was one service here that really, really, really did some heavy computation. Maybe you created an application that processes images or video or something like that. Then it might have made sense. I mean, even in that scenario, it would at this scale make sense to do what the SOA, SOA application is doing, where you have most of your code in one, in one project, and then you create that heavy computation service that just takes care of some processing or something like that. So... What I want you to take away from this is that the main differences between these different architectures is really just that question. Where do you put the code? Do you put it all in one repository? Do you put it in a few repositories? Or do you split everything down so that every module of your system, every domain entity, if you will, is in one separate service? The reason why you need to think about that is because it all comes down to how much code do you have? And if you have, if you if you, if you don't have a problem with too much code, or if you don't have a problem with people getting in each other's way, then a monolith is the right, usually the right option. It is usually the easiest thing. It's so it's the simplest thing to maintain. It's the simplest thing to work on, and so forth. And it usually is the thing that you should choose at a small scale company or a small size project. 
and then usually what happens is that you migrate into a SOA architecture. I mean, even if you don't, if you start a fresh project, sometimes for a large system, if you are working at a larger company, they don't talk about microservices necessarily. What they will do is that they will have an architect or some similar person who says that, okay, well, we have like a hundred people now and we are building this big car system or something like that for some company or finance product or something like that. And we know that we, we can't just put all that code in one place at the same time because then people are, we are not gonna be able to work on multiple things at the same time. So we create different services. So we might have one so part of the system that takes care of ordering and shipping and emails and stuff like that. And then there's another part of the system that takes care of inventory products and stuff like that. And then there's one part of the system that takes care of the user interface and the users and stuff like that. And that split there, if you notice, that's just a, you can think of it as a rougher split. If you think of a, the diff, like that's the difference between a monolithic or a SOA application and a microservice. Like a SOA application can, a SOA service can contain multiple responsibilities. Multiple concepts can exist within that same service. And there's no rule for how big a SOA application system is going to be. I mean, I could... I could have split this thing out here any way I wanted. I could have moved some of this code into the order service or something like that. It doesn't really matter. It, the, the only difference is that it's a network communication. And in the microservices case, you simply split it down to the smallest level so that you have multiple services that just take care of one very small part of the entire system. The time you want to use microservices over SOA is usually when you have a system which is so enormous that you pretty much have to split the two down to that fine-grained level in order to have people be productive because like if you th think about companies such as Google and Netflix and so forth they literally have that level of complexity where they have all these different services that needs to somehow all be maintained at the same time and they have tons and tons of people working on either one single service or a few services or something like that. You need to split it down really, really granularly because one thing that you should consider, which is a big benefit with microservices, is that if you redeploy a SOA application from a testing perspective or a stability perspective, odds are that you actually broke more code because you, every time you deploy a SOA application and you have quite a lot of code, you could have potentially cause more problems for that part of the system but in a microservices architecture if I redeploy the orders module this microservice here there is no chance that I have broken something within the books section of my service because the books I haven't touched any code that is correlated to that that is one of those big benefits the downside is that orchestrating all of these services and versioning and sharing models between these different services is a big hassle. It becomes an infrastructure problem rather than a code problem. So a monolith application, simplest thing you can possibly build. SOA is usually the thing that bigger companies use because it just makes more sense from an efficiency, efficiency perspective. You have more, more people that need to be able to do stuff. So you split things out so that different teams can take your responsibility for different things. Microservice is the pinnacle, which is where you split it down even further from a SOA, SOA level split to the smallest parts. And usually the reason you do that is either because you're a super company that has a need to do that, or you want to make sure you have a, you want to have, be very sure that it's easy to have a large distributed system that is fairly stable. These are the basic considerations of these different paradigms. Have a great day.